All right, so it looks like it's, it's 4.33, so we can get started. So welcome to this uh, fourth political economy session of the CSA conference this year. This is the last political economy session of, of the conference, but uh, it's a very, very exciting set of papers just uh, to establish a set of, of ground rules as we before we, we get started. Each speaker is gonna get 15 minutes. Uh, we're gonna have the four speakers uh, each in a row without time for question. And then we'll have kind of all the questions at the at the end. You'll be able to ask your questions in, in two ways. One by writing it down in the in the QA function of the of Zoom, or you'll be able to raise your hand as well. And then we'll we'll unmute you and allow you to ask your question. So uh, I'm not gonna waste any more of our time and I'm gonna ask Augustin to uh, get us started. Perfect. Can you see the slides and hear me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me to present uh, my work to the session. So today we're going to talk about a paper on optimal assignment of bureaucrats. Uh, and this will be based on uh, evidence from randomly assigned tax collectors in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And this is uh, with a team of co-author Pedro Bessone at Uber, John Kabea Kabea, who works at the tax ministry in Kananga, uh, DRC, uh, Gabe Turek at University of Pittsburgh, and John Weigel uh, at UC Berkeley. So the, the motivation for this project uh, is uh, based on the, the literature that shows that the assignment of workers to tasks and team uh, is an important determinant uh, of the productivity of firms, uh, so uh, private sector productivity. However, we have less information on whether the assignment of workers could also raise the performance of the public sector. Uh, and Exente, there's two reasons to think that it might be the case uh, that this assignment margin also matters in the public sector. The first um, reason is that typically the public sector face uh, more constraints in ra raising performance to incentives than the private sector uh, does face. So you can think of different uh, margins such as hiring. Uh, in the public sector, it's often uh, weakly tied to uh, expected performance. Uh, and so you can think of examination or, or patronage. Similarly, promotions uh, are typically constrained. Uh, they're not uh, uh, typically based on merit, but often based on seniority. And lastly, uh, firing in the public sector is also constrained due to life appointment uh, to public service. And so because the public sector has less um, performance, uh, uh, I mean, less ability to uh, raise performance through incentives, you might think that the assignment margin would be an important uh, aspect. A second reason why Exente, uh, the assignment might matter in the public sector is that bureaucrats uh, has been shown in a recent empirical literature uh, to explain the last share of the variation in government performance. And so if you think that bureaucrats are important in explaining the performance of the public sector, then the way they're assigned is also going to matter. Uh, and so that's what we, uh, you know, we take those, uh, those insights in this paper. And what we ask is whether the assignment of bureaucrats uh, can be used as a costless tool to increase the performance of the public sector. Uh, to answer this, oops, sorry. To answer this question, we're going to focus on uh, a specific setting, which is going to be a property tax campaign that took place in the city of Kananga, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And the bureaucrats we're going to focus on are frontline agent of the state, so the, the tax collector uh, themselves. Uh, and this uh, property tax collection took place was done by teams of two collectors and took place in two stages in all the neighborhoods of the city. The first stage was uh, the registration of the full neighborhood. During that stage, the tax collector assessed the tax liability of the property based on the building material, and they distribute to the property owner a unique tax ID and a tax letter. And that stage takes place for uh, a few days at the beginning of the tax period. The rest of the tax period, which is uh, a month, uh, consists of tax visit, where the, the tax collector, the teams of two tax collector, uh, do door-to-door -door tax appeal. They use handheld receipt printers to issue receipts to taxpayers uh, and their efforts, so the number or the timing of the visit, visits, as well as the tactic they use, uh, so the rhetoric they use to convince taxpayers to uh, pay, uh, is at their discretion. And we're going to see that this matters uh, for the mechanisms. Importantly, the, the, the assignment of tax collector was a uh, random. Uh, and so more specifically, it was a two-stage random assignment where every month teams of two tax collectors were uh, randomly formed, and, and there's 34 collectors in total. And then those teams were randomly assigned to work in two neighborhoods for the rest of the month. And this is the, the random assignment that we're going to uh, use to uh, identify the optimal assignment in the setting. This randomization was uh, successful. We show balance on characteristics of the property, the property owner, 
uh, and characteristics of the neighborhood. And to give you a sense of the assignment load of a typical uh, collector, uh, the tax collection uh, took place for six months. So each collector is going to work with six different teammates uh, and they're going to be assigned uh, on average uh, 12 neighborhoods, so two neighborhoods per month. And that's a total of 1,200 properties on average per uh, collector. And you might wonder why did they randomly assign collector to teammates and postings? The rationale in this context was to uh, primarily to avoid collusion uh, and, and in particular collusion between collectors, but also collusion between collector and households. In terms of the data, uh, we're going to uh, have access to administrative data for our tax outcome. Uh, that's going to come from the government's tax, data, tax database, uh, but we'll also have surveys that will mostly use to assess balance, but also to test for mechanism. We'll have a baseline and end line survey with a small sample of about 1,500 households and a midline survey with, uh, with, where we try to survey every single property owner in this context. Um, and, um, and a collector survey that we use as well for uh, mechanisms. And so briefly, uh, uh, what are we trying to do here? And so uh, in two slides, I'll, I kind of outline the conceptual framework and then we'll uh, show you how we estimate this conceptual framework and the data uh, before talking about the results. So we're going to think about a, a simple setting where uh, collectors, tax collectors are of two types. They're either a low uh, ability collector or a high ability collector meaning simply some, a collector that uh, is, is uh, collecting, uh, is good at collecting taxes versus less good at collecting taxes. We're going to think of household as two types as well, a uh, low or high, which is going to uh, try to capture the household's uh, economic ability to pay uh, the tax. So a low type would be a household with low ability to pay and a high type, a household with a high ability to pay. In this context, a match type is going to be a, a triplet uh, with the two types of the collector and the type of the household. Uh, and there'll be two objects of interest uh, for our analysis. The first one is going to be the production function uh, of our tax administration. In other words, the expected tax compliance, uh, which is the function given here. And it's simply the tax compliance that we expect for a given match type, for a given you know, set of co collector type and household type. So equipped with this uh, production function of the administration, we can then identify the optimal assignment. Uh, and first it's worth mentioning that an assignment function is this context is going to be simply a, a density, a distribution of match type. So each, what's fraction of each possible match type uh, in, in the total uh, assignment. Uh, and in particular, what we're interested in is identifying the optimal assignment function F star that is given by this uh, formula here. What does this formula mean? It simply means that the optimal assignment uh, is the assignment function that maximizes tax compliance. That's our first, first row here, subject to two status quo allocation constraints given here and here. Um, and what those status quo allocation constraints mean is simply uh, the first one is a non-overlapping assignment constraint, which means that we restrict the size of the collector team to be uh, one a team of two collector per household. So you're not distorting the fact that uh, each neighborhood or each household is visited by a team of two collectors. Uh, and the second constraint, um, or the last one on this formula, is a workload constraint, which simply tell us that the number of assignment by collector type is the same as under the status quo. So here we're keeping the workload uh, constraint of each type of tax collector the same as under the status quo and not distorting that margin. And so what we want to do is to estimate this framework. Um, and before being able to estimate the uh, average tax compliance function and characterize the optimal assignment, um, we need to uh, identify a household type or define household type and define collector type. To define household type, we're going to rely on the fact that in 78 neighborhoods of the city, uh, neighborhood chiefs who are local and notable in charge of solving disputes uh, and implementing informal taxation, uh, those chiefs were asked to predict the ability to pay of each property owner in the neighborhood. That took place a few days before tax collection. They reviewed photographs of each property in the city and they uh, predicted the owner's economic ability to pay. Uh, and we're going to categorize as low type a property owner that's deemed unlikely to pay according to the chief and high type a property owner that's deemed likely or very likely to pay according to the chief. And that gives us a split of about a third of household being low type and two thirds being high type. The second step is going to be to define collector type. Here, we don't have baseline information about the performance of the collector. So we're going to use a different approach. What we do is we uh, use the fixed effect model. Uh, so simply regressing our tax outcome on indicator for each tax collector involved in the neighborhood. And to avoid overfitting, 
we estimate it uh, in another set of neighborhood that we call our howl dot sample. So you can see them in blue on the or in red on this map, and in blue you have the house the neighborhood with the prediction. We're going to shrink those estimates uh, uh, because they might be noisy. They're unbiased but noisy, and we'll then partition uh, collectors into type using those uh, uh, shrunk estimates. You might wonder what's the right number of types. So we use unsupervised machine learning to kind of uh, tell us what should the number of types be in this context. And most methods tell us that two is the optimal number of types. So that's what we end up doing. We rank tax collector using our shrunk estimates and we define a high type collector as being above the median, low type collector as being below the median. Equipped with those household and, and a collector type, we can then estimate our average tax compliance function non-parametrically by regressing our uh, tax uh, outcome on dummies for each of the possible match type. Uh, and our coefficients are going to be uh, identified under random assignment. We can then plug in this, uh, this average tax compliance function in our optimal assignment problem that I've introduced a few, few slides ago and simply solve uh, for uh, the optimal assignment F star. And so in the uh, last five minutes, I'm going to talk about our results. Uh, and starting with the uh, expected tax compliance function, uh, which is so shown on the slide, it simply tells us tax compliance on the y-axis for each of the possible match types. So on the x-axis, you have the collector uh, type, so either low, low, uh, low, high, or high, high. And then uh, as two different lines in blue and red, you have the household types. Um, blue is the low type household and red is high type household. And so what do we notice for, from this uh, expected tax compliance function? We notice two things. The first is that it's going to be convex in collector type. Uh, what we see is that the increase in tax compliance between LH and HH is much higher than between LL and LH. And we can actually text, test uh, for uh, nonlinearities uh, in collector type, and we find evidence uh, of nonlinearities of convexity here. Uh, and so this is going to generate a first prediction that is that under the optimal assignment, uh, you should have assortative matching of tax collectors. You should put the high high collectors together and the low low collectors together. A second dimension of interest is going to be a second uh, complementarity in this figure, which is between collector and household type. What we see is that the increase in tax compliance associated with being assigned a high type household is much higher for the uh, high type collectors or high type pairs than for the low type pairs. So this arrow here is much larger than this arrow here. And we can again test for this convexity in collector household type and we find evidence of nonlinearities on statistically significant. And this suggests that under the optimal assignment you should have a second dimension of assortative matching. The high type pairs should be uh, assigned to high type households and the low type pair should be assigned to low type households. Uh, and then you can see this only from the expected tax compliance function, but uh, we uh, still look at what happens for the uh, optimal assignment function F star when solving our, our, uh, our, uh, our model. And that's exactly what we find. We find evidence of complete assortative matching. In other words, the status quo uh, assignment in blue uh, is the random uh, assignment as shown by the, the bars here. And in red, what we see is that the optimal assignment suggests to only have uh, uh, homogeneous teams. So high type collectors are together and low type collectors are together. And most of the high type collectors are sent to high type households. Most of the low type collectors are sent to low type household. There's a bit of a residual of low type pairs that are sent to high type household. That's because the, the split uh, of household is not 50-50, it's two third, one third, okay? In the paper, we uh, look a little bit at mechanism, trying to explain why uh, do we see complementarities in this expected compliance function. And there's two potential stories we're interested in. The first is uh, that it could be about collector skill, that high type collectors are more persuasive when they're teamed with uh, high type uh, teammates. We don't find evidence that's the case. There's no complementarity or convexity uh, in the message used by the tax collector or in the citizen's perception about the likelihood of sanction. So it doesn't seem to be about collector skill. The second explanation is about collector effort. And here we find much more evidence that high type collector exert greater effort when they're paired with uh, a high type teammate. They visit on more days and more hours. Uh, and we find the same for uh, midline survey um, visits. One more minute, is that correct? Two more minutes, yeah. Two more minutes, perfect. Uh, and so overall, we find evidence that effort is the primary mechanism in this context. And we discuss a little bit in the paper in, in further detail, why do visit matter and why does effort matter? And we find evidence that 
by exerting more effort, the high type collector teams are able to relax households cash on hand constraint. Uh, and that seems to be uh, explaining the results uh, here. In the next, in the last one and a half minute I have, I'll talk about what would be the impact of implementing the optimal assignment on tax compliance and revenue. And so what we do is we kind of go back to our uh, compliance function now that we've identified the optimal assignment uh, and, and look at the, um, at the difference in tax compliance that would be predicted under the status quo assignment versus under the optimal assignment. And what we see is that tax compliance would be predicted to increase by about three percentage points, which is a, an increase in compliance of about 37%. So pretty large increase associated with implementing the optimal assignment. And if you try to separate which dimension of the optimal assignment matters more, is it collector to collector or collector to household, we find that they contribute roughly equally. Those are the two bars in the middle. So both dimension of the optimal assignment matter. If we were to ignore one of them, we'd get less, way less uh, uh, important results. Oops, sorry. I put a timer. Uh, we do a lot of robustness check that I'll, see, uh, I'll skip since uh, I'm out of time. Uh, we don't find much evidence of an increase in bribe, which you might worry about when uh, implementing the optimal assignment. Uh, and we don't find much evidence that it would also affect tax morale. So to conclude, uh, we uh, studied a field experiment that uh, focused on the random uh, assignment on ta of tax collector to neighborhoods and teammates. This allows us to identify the optimal assignment, which we find to be a, a sortative matching on both collector type and collector to household type. Uh, and this is due to complementarities that reflect high type collectors exerting greater effort when matched with other high types. Uh, and we find that implementing the optimal assignment would lead to a large increase in tax compliance by about 37%. So in other words, bureaucrat assignment uh, can be used potentially as a resource neutral policy to increase fiscal capacity uh, in low uh, capacity settings. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Augustin. It was great. Uh, now we're going to move to Donna. OK, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. And you don't see the box on the side, right? Do I have to minimize that? Never know. I think it's fine. Okay, good. Um, okay, hi everyone. So this is a paper um, about police in Ghana. And um, as the title shows, it's, it's called Proud to Belong, the Impact of Ethics Training on Police Officers in Ghana. And it's um, a joint paper with um, a bunch of co-authors, Awana Volkan, Danila Serra, Henry Telly, um, ICG in, in Ghana, Bruno Schettini, um, who's a, actually was a police officer in Brazil, um, but also did MPP uh, program in, in Oxford, and Stefan Dercon. So the motivation um, of this paper came about um, because of our interest in public sector performance. Um, and that, you know, a big question is, is, is basically uh, <clears throat> results in a lot of inefficiency in developing countries. And how do we improve performance in public sector? A uh, lot of literature have looked at incentives, um, monitoring, pay, management practice, supervision, um, goal setting, and selection, as Augustine was talking about, um, and recruitment process. In this paper, we look at a slightly different angle. Um, we wanted to focus on kind of softer skills. Um, and the question is, can we leverage intrinsic motivations and identity to shift attitudes and behaviors um, among the public sector employees? And in our cases, the traffic police in Ghana. So we conducted a field experiment, randomized control trial to test um, the impact of ethics integrity, integrity training and attitudes, values, and behavior of Ghana police um, service. So we focus on traffic police um, because they frequently interact with the citizens. The police itself, not just the traffic police um, as an organization, is very hierarchical and they have a lot of discretionary power, very hard um, for low level officials um, or officers to go against the order. They have a lot of um, respect for the superiors hard to measure misbehavior um, and is hard to study in general. Um, the police, however, is often perceived to be the most corrupt 
um, in the government. In Ghana, 59% of um, corruption barometer um, respondents think that most or all the police officers are corrupt. Data from you know, various other sources and previous other studies as well, um, especially just want to zoom in on false Apoku um, Akimang in 2016. Um, they follow track, truck drivers, not track, truck drivers, traveling between Ghana and Burkina Faso, and um, they found that stopped on average um, by police officers uh, around 16 times and it, over 80% um, of the times I had to pay a bribe when interacting with the police. I'm not gonna go through all the literature in the interest of time, um, but there are, so we looked at literature that look at police officers, um, looking at financial incentives, um, targeting interaction between police and community. Um, and as I said before, what we want to look at is um, the notion of identity and intrinsic motivation. So the literature that we, um, you know, base our uh, design on is Akalov, Cranton, um, Binabu Tirol, Vesli Gatak, which is basically looking at intrinsic motivation in organization, which shared mission. But I'll come to that in a moment because with the, the, the police, um, which is corrupt, the, the mission with an organization distorted. Um, and there is not much literature on activating or reactivating intrinsic motivation. So you might start off being a police officer because you're motivated to serve the people and you have intrinsic motivation. However, you know, over time along the way, you've kind of lost this um, intrinsic motivation. And when the organization mission is not what it's supposed to be, it's not in the ideal um, place where, you know, you want to align your motivation with the organization. So what do we do? So the intervention we did, um, we created an innovative or rethink innovative training program um, over two days. Um, and this is very interactive. It was actually delivered by Bruno Schettini, one of our co-authors who has a lot of experience in training police officers. This was done in April and May, 2019. We also created afterwards WhatsApp groups to kind of reinforce the interactions that they had during the training. And we had um, a graduation ceremony where we presented them with lapel pin, which I'll show a picture in a moment, which is a symbol of you know, their, their change identity as agents of change. That's what we call um, them, them after they've been trained. We have full support cooperation with Ghana police, um, a lot of obstacles and challenges around that, which I'm not gonna go into. Um, implementation, so two thirds of traffic police districts in greater Accra, um, randomly selected to receive training. Half of the officers in these districts participate based on predetermined duty rosters. So just wanted to say that basically we invited, you know, these um, districts into, um, you know, the treatment group, but only half of officers in these districts participated because they also had duty to go and station in different traffic, um, you know, uh, positions. So they couldn't come and the rosters were um, randomly assigned. So about 80% of the police um, that we interviewed in the baseline said that their position or where they would be working is actually determined randomly, especially the lower rank um, officers. So then we have three groups with this kind of design that we had to work with. We had untrained um, officers in the control district, of course, and we have untrained in the treatment districts and then train in the treatment district. And as I said before, the training mechanism that we focus on is about intrinsic motivation, individual identity as a service provider. And then we have also the newly formed collective identity as agent of change. Again, only summarizing this slide is that there's some literature on ethics training, but previous literature hasn't really found um, evidence of effectiveness of ethics training. Um, and the most related one is Khan's study, which is the, the recent one, um, which aim also at activating intrinsic motivation. So this is what we're also trying to um, do. Very, uh, you know, briefly on the actual training. So this training program split into two days, as I said before, with a week in between. Um, because we want them to internalize the first day and, you know, talk among themselves. 
and then come back the second day. So the first day was all about intrinsic motivation, individual identities and values. So what values they need to be the, the, the ideal police officer or um, the, the good police officer. So this is basically, we wanted to get them to think about why they join and reactivate that intrinsic motivation, they have discussion, they have exercises, role play um, about values and in different scenarios, what kind of values that they should use um, to deal with different sort of challenges and, and dilemmas during the um, line of duty. Then a week has gone, the second um, day happens a week later. So we had all the officers who participate in Monday, on Monday in the week, in the first week, will come back on a Monday in the second week. So they stay in the same group. Um, so day two is about team building, is about re, well, not reestablished, but actually creating a new group identity called the Agents of Change. Um, we also produced a video, we, we did a documentary in Brazil um, and show to them that change has happened um, in the highway police in Brazil to motivate them and, and for them to be able to identify that change is possible. Um, we also talk about goal setting. So we implemented the SMART um, goal setting exercise. And finally, as the last exercise, they also had to create their group dance in the kind of haka, if you're familiar with rugby, um, the New Zealand all black kind of style and they did it I mean we had we have a lot of fun and, and videos to kind of you know show them afterwards as well so this is um some of the pictures from the training this exercise where the, the kind of team building exercise where some of them had their hands tied some of them had the blindfold and they had to draw um you know something of I think it's like um what um a, a ideal police officer should, should do or in a certain scenario. Um, and as I said, afterwards we had WhatsApp group for six months, um, moderated by Bruno, who gave the training. We had the award ceremony um, with this lapel pin, um, which we presented to them by the senior uh, officers. I should also mention that in um, the training sessions, so we had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday we didn't have because actually they were all very busy Thursday, Friday, and we had a mixed ranking um, of, of officers that came. Donna? Yes. You have five more minutes. Oh my God. I knew it was going to be uh, okay. Right. So we had a baseline and um, we did that face to face. Random uh, selection 21 out of 32 districts received training. Um, and we did the training April, May. We went back quite late because of COVID um, in December, 2020 um, for the end line. Okay, very quickly here, we did the surveys. We asked questions around um, values, a lot of it on perception of corruption, reporting um, or uh, having seen unethical behavior and reporting it, but the main, uh, outcome variables here is the um, incentivized cheating game. So we did the mind game um, and uh, sequential pair uh, dice roll. So balance tests, um, more or less um, quite well balanced. And here we're looking at, you know, mean uh, control and treatment and train and untrain in the treatment group. Um, not going to go into this, but here the kind of the main highlight here is the um, the officers who stated that number role is equal to the number of one on their mind. So obviously, um, this is across you know controlled and untrained and trained. Um, the theoretical prediction is uh, one over six, so it's, it's way you know they're all kind of equally lying about the the match. Um, Endline data collection, we had to do the phone survey. We did shorter survey because it's over the phone. We did coin toss game instead of the mind game. Um, and we looked at the average treatment effect. Um, and we also did intent to treat and we did late as well um, for checking um, the randomization of our design. So just very, very quickly, this is evidence on survey and I have another one on the graph, which is the game. Um, as you can see, we have 
So this is untrained in, in the treatment and then trained in the treatment. We have, uh, you know, it looks you know, quite a good one, especially on the value index or significant um, effects. We have all the results in the paper. Um, also reporting uh, index, not so much on monitoring um, and some on citizen relationship index. So again, yeah, you, have, you have two minutes. Two minutes, okay. On the value index and reporting index and relationship with the citizen, um, the train uh, in the treatment, we have significant um, results as you can see. And here is the game generated outcome where you can see the shift um, you know, towards kind of the, the middle um, distribution for the coin flip, which is what we did in the end line. So we, we see an effect basically. Um, and this is kind of backed up by the regression results here that's reduce um, lying as a result of, of training. I'm not gonna have time then to go into robustness mechanism. So we did a lot. Um, there's also some that were in the control who were trained. We check for that. We included them in the, in the control at first, which is conservative. We also dropped them. We did a lot of analysis on mechanism. And what we found was that initial intrinsic motivation matter. So that's the highlight, that's the takeaway that if you were intrinsically um, motivated, this training actually worked in reactivating your intrinsic motivation. So very, very quickly, 30 seconds on summary. Um, so basically, as I said, significant impact on the measure of values and beliefs and also incentivize cheating game. We reactivate intrinsic motivation to serve the public. Um, we didn't find significant result on creating new identity as agent of change. And, um, but overall, reactivating intrinsic motivation is the seems to be in the mechanism for the training. Uh, thanks a lot, Donna. It was actually 20 seconds extra you had. Uh, so thanks. We can now move to Sebastian. Yes, let's see. So I hope that you can see my slides. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Uh, great. So uh, thanks a lot for, for having me. I'm Sebastian. I'm a postdoc at the Kiel Institute for the World Economy. Uh, and I'm going to be presenting my paper, Transparency and the Allocation of Talent in Public Organizations. Uh, so let me start by uh, motivating this project uh, by, by the sort of statement that we've uh, sort of touched upon already by previous presenters that state capacity is a key uh, determinant of economic performance. And we know that individual bureaucrats are um, sort of the, uh, the human capital uh, behind state capacity. They are responsible for implementing government policy and for the delivery of public goods and, and services. However, motivating bureaucrats and assigning them to different types of government tasks um, has proven to be a, a key challenge in a lot of settings. So the way that this works um, in theory is that you have sort of a, a merit-based uh, system in which bureaucrats are hired and assigned to, to tasks based on their qualifications. In practice, however, uh, this is rarely the case because the bureaucracy is seldom uh, completely autonomous from outside factors. And one of these outside factors that I'm going to be focusing on today is that of political interference. In other words, a situation in which politicians may have incentives to um, interfere in the allocation of talent within uh, the public sector. Now, of course, this doesn't necessarily have to be uh, negative. Uh, in some settings, it might be the case that politicians have uh, better information about how to allocate their respective civil staff. But I think that from a lot of the um, existing studies, we've sort of noticed that such interference is generally harmful to um, public sector outputs. And the reason for this being that uh, the most skilled bureaucrats do not necessarily get assigned uh, the most important government tasks, uh, which is something that then has detrimental effects for state capacity and consequently hampers economic development. So a potential remedy to such bureaucratic inefficiencies that stem from uh, political interference is government transparency. So if you were to take a very stylized political economy model, you could say that um, 
a better informed electorate is more likely to vote for uh, a set of more competent and honest politicians. And in turn, politicians of higher quality are more likely to operate an efficient bureaucracy to improve on policy implementation. So this is sort of the, the long route of accountability uh, in uh, previous literature. So while this story may seem very intuitive, uh, I think that it's very much an open question to what extent uh, such transparency measures can actually mitigate patronage and in the end improve uh, the organization of the state. So this brings me to uh, my paper. So I'm going to focus on the Indian Administrative Service, um, abbreviated the IAS. Uh, so I'm sure that most of you know, this is the elite layer of bureaucracy in India. These are individuals that are highly merited and have very, very high uh, baseline qualifications. At the same time, uh, this is a bureaucracy that is particularly susceptible to political interference. So politicians have a lot uh, to say about where these individuals end up within, uh, within the state. So what I do in this project is to assemble rich microdata on individual IAS officers. Um, so I basically have a data set of biographical data, uh, information about their merits and qualifications prior to uh, joining the service. And I also observe uh, a quite extensive uh, information about their career paths. Uh, so I know at any given point in time what these individuals uh, work with and for how long they have been doing so. So I'm going to use this data and study the impact of a salient anti-corruption or transparency reform uh, that was uh, not at all targeted towards uh, bureaucrats, uh, but rather towards politicians. So what this reform entailed was that individual political candidates that were thinking of standing for election had to submit private information to the public prior to contesting political office. The idea behind this reform was to make it easier for voters to sort among candidates of varying quality and in the end to make a more informed decision on who to vote for. Now this reform was implemented as a court ruling all across India in 2003. So the way that I'm going to implement or to identify the uh, causal impact of this reform is to utilize the fact that different Indian states hold elections at different points in time around uh, this event. So using the data that I just briefly described along with this reform, I'm basically going to try to answer the question that I posed on the previous slide. So can we uh, sort of find evidence on whether or not this long route of accountability seems to be true? And one way that I'm going to try to answer that is to focus on two central outcomes that I regard as proxies for meritocracy. The first one is going to be merit-based uh, merit assignment to tasks, something that I call skills mismatch in the paper, which basically measures the misallocation of talent within uh, the public sector. So uh, to what extent, uh, or basically capturing the match quality of individual bureaucrats to government jobs. The second measure is going to be merit-based promotion, uh, another central pillar of uh, meritocracy. So this is something that I refer to as returns to skill in the paper. Um, so you can think that in a very non-transparent system, it might not be the case that the individuals that have the highest qualifications are those that actually reach the top positions because of patronage concerns or other factors. So I'm going to look at to what extent that relationship between skill and promotion changes with this transparency reform. So just a quick word before I go into the results, I just wanted to clarify how I measure skills in this, in this setting. Uh, so I basically observe uh, three distinct parts of, uh, of skill, and the first one being uh, education. So I observe each individual's years of education uh, in terms of their uh, educational degrees that they had prior to joining uh, the service. I also observe uh, the number of weeks they spend in additional training to improve on their career prospects. Uh, and finally, I didn't say this before, but similar to many other bureaucratic systems around the world, the way that you can become one of these bureaucrats is by taking a, an entry level exam. So here I don't observe uh, their test scores, but I do observe the relative ranking in each of these cohorts. So these are the three uh, measures that I argue are sort of correlated with uh, bureaucrat ability in this setting. So 
how do you then measure uh, match quality? Of course, this is a very tricky thing in the public sector, but what I'm going to do is to uh, follow a literature in labor economics and quantify deviations from an officer's qualification set relative to some average reference skill level for each specific uh, task uh, denoted by K. So essentially, I'm going to say that an individual is mismatched if his or her um, skill level when working with a specific task K is different from some average uh, reference skill in absolute terms. So um, this is, of course, very tricky to, um, so basically, how do you capture this, this reference level of skill? Uh, that's a very tricky thing. So what I argue for in the paper is that if we believe that the reform actually reduced uh, mismatch or improved the matching of bureaucrats to task, uh, then it makes sense to calculate this reference average in the post-treatment period. Now, of course, that's not entirely problem-free because this reference level of skill may also have changed with the reform. But I argue that I can control for such compositional changes by uh, controlling for task-specific fixed effects and allowing for different trends uh, within, within tasks. Now, I have three distinct measures of skill. So basically what I do in the paper is to aggregate them, uh, this, uh, these mismatches into an, uh, an index that I call the mismatch index. And what I think is important to just take away here is that this is a variable that is gonna have temporal variation due to the fact that individual bureaucrats uh, are assigned to different tasks across their careers. So this brings me to uh, the results. So this is a staggered difference in differences design, um, which means that nowadays, of course, you would have to also account for uh, the recent advances in the econometrics literature. Uh, so actually, to be specific, I'm using a uh, stacked by event approach here to overcome these, uh, the issues of negative weighting uh, and uh, heterogeneous treatment effects, uh, just to put that aside. So, Basically, I'm regressing here the mismatch index on a set of mutually exclusive time dummies around uh, this reform event. And basically, there are two patterns that sort of stand out. The first of all is that I don't really find any evidence for pre-trend uh, prior to the introduction of this reform. But what happens is that as the reform becomes binding, you sort of see this downward pattern in the coefficients suggesting that mismatch falls as a result of this, of this reform. The second main result in the paper is the uh, returns to bureaucrat skill. So the way that I measure this is um, I don't really have data on, yeah, I don't really have data on uh, individual uh, wages, uh, but what I do have information about is their uh, relative position in sort of the vertical hierarchy within the bureaucracy. So what I do here is to test to what extent um, higher skills makes it likelier that you reach the top before and after the reform. So is it the case that skills are better rewarded in more or less transparent uh, environments? That's basically what I'm attempting to test for with this relationship. And to do that, I basically regress a dummy uh, indicating whether or not an individual officer is indeed at the top of the bureaucracy as a function of these, again, these relative time indicators and an interaction between these time indicators and a variable that I call the skill index. Now, this is just a, um, an aggregate of these three measures of skill that I talked about before. So you can just think of this as having a higher value on this skill index basically means that you have higher qualifications. And I'm interested here in testing uh, and estimating these mu j coefficients uh, to basically test whether or not there are differential returns to skill uh, across the two uh, sort of reform periods. And what I find here is that while the first figure sort of uh, gives you somewhat of a hint of a pre-trend here. I say that, uh, or I show that if you just control for uh, fixed effects for experience, in other words, comparing officers that have sort of similar level of tenure, uh, then you find that there isn't much of a pre-trend, but there are positive uh, post-treatment coefficients, suggesting that higher skills are more likely to generate improved career prospects in more transparent as compared to less transparent uh, environments. So 
I just wanted to mention one line of heterogeneity, which I think is kind of important for this study, is that if you actually dig into this skill index and split individual, split the sample into different parts of the skill index, you actually find a quite different picture. So indeed it is the case that for officers that have the highest level of skill, you see these positive returns to, to their qualifications. But for officers who are at the bottom of the skill index, you actually see negative returns. So what this suggests is that it's not only the case that high skilled officers are more likely to reach the top, it's also the case that low skilled officers are sort of weeded out from top positions uh, after the implementation of this reform. So I won't really have time to go through all of the, uh, the rest of the heterogeneity and mechanisms that I look for in the, in the paper, uh, but I just wanted to mention that um, I sort of conjectured that um, these results might be driven by high skilled officers that end up in a better bargaining position uh, in the more transparent setting. You might also wonder to what extent these results are driven by uh, sort of improved political selection or political incentives. And the way that I test for this in the paper is to look at uh, spillover effects where the reform is not yet binding. And I do seem to find that uh, these uh, spillover effects or the behavior of politicians actually seem to be quite important. I do not, however, find any evidence that um, the uh, sort of electoral uh, considerations matter all too much for, for these results. So it is not the case that this reform induces a lot of changes in uh, electoral outcomes, such as uh, turnout and, and similar things. Okay, so let me uh, use the final time to, to conclude. Uh, so this paper is the first empirical investigation of how improved political transparency can affect the assignment of bureaucrats across public tasks. Uh, I focus on the Indian context where the top layer of bureaucracy is notorious for its uh, susceptibility and proneness to political interference. And then I study this substantial transparency and anti-corruption reform uh, and basically study its effects on the organization or the management of uh, the bureaucracy in, in each respective Indian state. And I find along these two uh, dimensions of meritocracy that this reform actually decreased skills mismatch and increased returns to skill. And I think the main takeaway from my paper is that while there already exists a quite a substantial literature, I would say, about political interference, both in terms of political science and economics, um, and its effects on, on uh, um, public sector performance, I think that we know relatively little about how to mitigate uh, such potential concerns. And I think that the uh, sort of positive conclusion from this is that as voters become better informed about the rep representatives, which is basically what happens through this reform, uh, there seems to be positive spillover effects in the way that uh, politicians organize and manage their uh, respective civil staff. So thanks a lot for listening. I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks, Sebastian. That's Thank very you. Interesting. Uh, Kate, over to you. Thanks very much for having me and thanks everyone for coming. I'm gonna turn this to full screen mode. Uh, great, so this I'm gonna present joint work with Hamna Ahmed and Darin Latif at the Lahore School of Economics on the unintended consequences of accountability in policing in Pakistan. So a very common situation in public sector organizations as well as private sector organizations is uh, a setting of a principal dealing with an agent. Um, in this paper, we're going to think about the setting in which elected politicians are acting as principals and they're trying to hold the, bureau the agents in the bureaucracy accountable for delivering public services. There's a lot of research on this, uh, but very heavily focused on certain types of public services, in particular education and health. And uh, we're going to be looking at it in the context of policing. So a well-known problem is that if the principal can't completely observe what the agent is doing, then the, the pressure for accountability pressure from the principal to the agent could backfire. So that could be multitasking where the agent works on the task that's incentivized instead of the other tasks that aren't incentivized or aren't observed as well. Um, it could also uh, include mani direct manipulation of the signal to the principal. So, it's not, so cheating on a test, if you're a teacher, it's dealing, dealing with high stakes testing uh, incentives, for example. Um, in, the, in the case of signal manipulation, the agent somehow, manip somehow uh, 
uh, uh, uh, fiddles with the, the information it's going to the principal about what the agent's doing. So we're going to be using administrative data from the, from the police force in Pakistan to document how agents manipulate signals to p political principles. And we're going to look at the effect of two things. The first is the effect of accountability pressure, which we capture using variation in political alignment over time. And the second is variation in observability in which the principal can start to see more of what the agent is doing as a new crime report database gets rolled out. So just to give you an idea of kind of where this is going, uh, what we find is that political accountability pressure actually does a disservice to the, the, the citizens who are, uh, who are represented by uh, parliamentarians from the, from the governing party because the pressure leads to increased signal manipulation. So we find that police are less likely to register citizen crime reports in areas that support the governing party where politicians are able to exert uh, more pressure on them. We are going to do a bunch of things to rule out the possibility that what's actually going on is that there's less crime. And just to, to preview, we find that when somebody reports a crime, it's less likely to be pursued and registered. Staffing, so all the inputs that you might think uh, that politicians would try to bring to their own constituencies, like increasing staffing levels, getting the police to respond faster, those things don't change. And we see a substitution effect between property crimes and non-criminal lost reports. So this could be something like, I come into the police station, say I've been mugged and my wallet was stolen and it gets registered as my wallet was lost so that I can get you know, my property replaced or get my ID card renewed. So all of this is consistent with the idea that officials are under-registering crime reports under pressure to keep crime statistics low. So that pressure is basically backfiring. And when a new crime report tracking database is rolled out, which improves the principal's ability to observe what's going on, we see a reduction in, under in this sort of under-registration of crime. So we're studying this issue in the context of the police in Lahore district in Pakistan. Um, <clears throat> this is, a, this is a, a provincially run public service where we, it's, it's, it's divided up geographically. So we're going to uh, uh, have, the, we're gonna use this micro data from uh, catchment area, 83 catchment areas. Each police station has its defined catchment area. So if a, a crime occurs in that catchment area, it's supposed to be dealt with by the police station that it's assigned to. And over a period of several years for all of these stations, we're going to observe several things. The first is that we observe each registered crime, which is called in, uh, in the, the sort of official jargon, a first information report. So this is like the official paperwork that lets you move forward with doing anything to get an arrest, with taking it to court. You need a first information report to get any kind of access to justice. So we're gonna observe each of these with the station, the date and the type of crime. Once this new database is rolled out, we're also going to observe all of the reports where citizens come into the police station, um, even if the police don't actually register them. So we, that means we can construct then an indicator for whether a filed report where the citizen came in actually gets processed and registered with this FIR. <clears throat> now, uh, the, the um, recording of these initial reports can, if, is, is may, I'm going to talk in a minute about why we think that it's less subject to manipulation than the ultimate registration of the crime with the FIR. It could still be manipulated, but just as to give a sense of context, we observe actually a lot of, so 74% of violent crime reports and 67% of nonviolent crime reports that are supposed to get uh, registered aren't in the database. So clearly there, this database is capturing some of what's going on that, that doesn't get registered. Okay, so I said we're gonna talk, but we're gonna look at uh, two things. The first is the effect of increased accountability pressure. So how are we doing that? Uh, we're going to use uh, a variation over a, an electoral cycle to capture the effect of politicians basically having more leverage over the bureaucrats in the police. So we, uh, we, we have data that spans over this election cycle in 2018. And two things happened in that election. One is that the party in power changed. And then the other is that you know, the, the vote share in any given uh, constituency uh, also changed. So we have a, a pretty dramatic shift in what proportion of any given constituency was, uh, was uh, uh, aligned with the governing party. 
So we're going to take that information, we're going to overlay it over our police station catchment areas in order to, uh, un to uh, get a proxy for how much aligned is that particular station's catchment area with the governing party and use that as a proxy for political pressure. And the reason we think that that's a good proxy for political pressure is that, as been alluded to by some of the, the earlier presenters on the panel, uh, there's just a huge amount of, of uh, documentation in the, in the South Asian context that elected officials play a huge role in influencing the, the um, postings and transfers. And anecdotally, that's kind of very commonly reported as well. The, 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 you really care about what these elected uh, members of the provincial assembly uh, think of you because if they don't like you, they can make your life really difficult as a police officer. So our identifying assumption here is going to be that areas with a change in alignment with the incumbent government don't also have some change in crime occurrence reporting or recording at the same time as the election for other reasons that are unrelated. And uh, we, I'm going to show you sort of a, a, a more collapsed table version of our estimates, but uh, basically, all of the event studies show that there's no pre-trend uh, happening kind of differentially by this variable before the election. So everything's kind of really lining up with the, the timing of the election in a way that it, it seems consistent with, with the shift in political power really driving this. So uh, what do we find? Uh, basically, an increase in political pressure decreases the number of crimes registered. That's the first column. And in the second column, we're going to then leverage that additional data we have from crime reports and see that it also decreases the probability of a given crime report being registered. So it's not that the crime rate is, go it's not that actual crime is going down in the field. What's happening is I'm coming into the police station and the probability that my, my uh, uh, crime report is actually getting registered is going down. Uh, so that's the second column. Now we might be worried, as I alluded earlier, to uh, we might be worried about the possibility that I still what's actually going on is that the uh, elected officials who come in and have this additional power uh, because they're uh, they're a part of the governing party are actually trying to just provide a better service to their constituency. So they might be improving resources for the police. So we test for this uh, by looking at response time and the number of officers posted into a given station at a given point in time. And, uh, what, and with this basically nothing going on. So no increase in staffing, no increase in response time, a decrease in the number of registered crimes, a decrease in the probability that a given crime report actually gets registered. And then finally, the final kind of piece of evidence really kind of helps to cement this is that we see this kind of uh, offsetting effect where the, the uh, uh, criminal property crime reports, so the, the number of criminal property crime reports goes down and correspondingly, the number of property loss reports goes up. So this is the case that I suggested before where uh, I, you know, I've been mugged, go into the police station and I say, hey, you know, I've been mugged at gunpoint uh, or somebody kind of beat me and took my wallet and, I, and the, the police say, look, it's, we're never gonna find the guy. Um, let's just fill out your uh, form saying that you've lost your wallet and you'll be able to get your new ID card issued and you'll be done. So, uh, and so will we. <laughs> so, so that's a really uh, very consistent with this kind of apparent substitution pattern going on here. Okay, so I hope I've been able to convince you that uh, what everything we're seeing in the data is really consistent, not with a reduction in crime, but with a uh, reduction in the registration of crime reports that, that are brought into the police. So is there anything that policymakers can do about it? Well, over the Kate, time frame, five? Kate, five minutes, yeah. Awesome, five. thank you. Uh, so over the time frame that we study, this new crime tracking database gets rolled out. So I'm going to talk briefly here about what exactly is it that's happening with this database. The, the red text here highlights what happened before at a given point, before the new database at a given point in time, and the blue what happens after. So before the, before the new system, a uniformed officer who is subject to the exact same incentive system that all the other police officers are in the hierarchy, he would take your uh, crime report. After the new, the new system is brought in, basically trained data entry front desk staff type, uh, uh, type officials are brought in. They're not hired by the police station chief. They're not promoted by the police station chief. They're not on the police career track. So this person here who's sitting, you can see her entering the data in, at the front desk, 
um, is uh, she's the one who's now uh, she, uh, who's now entering the initial report. So she should we expect that she should be not necessarily completely immune to, but definitely less subject to the to kind of pressure to under register that a, another police that a police officer would be. Secondly, uh, in in the in the past in pre pre reform. Uh, the the everything would be registered on paper in a daily diary, which in theory the higher ups could come and look at, but in practice is obviously a huge pain and very time consuming to come and check. Uh, so now instead it goes right into this database. A tracking number is issued, and uh, it, it immediately any senior official can log into the database and see like what's happening today in this police station, what's happening with this particular person's crime report, etc. Okay, the next stage is the same, which is that there's that there's supposed to be a preliminary probe. The station chief can make a final decision about filing the first information report, which is required to move forward in the justice system. Um, and as I as I mentioned, it, in order to monitor at this, the senior level officials have in the past had to visit the station in person. Now they can access real time. And uh, these statistics are uh, on the the total. The, importantly, these the final thing that the the higher ups really see and discuss at the high level meetings are the number of registered crimes. It, during the time frame that we're studying, they're not seeing the aggregate information on. Uh, they're not seeing and discussing in the in their in the uh, political meetings, like how many crimes, crime reports have uh, have happened. So that, that's kind of the thing that they're observing and pushing on. Um, okay, so this gets rolled out uh, station by station over a period of time, which it, which uh, luckily spans the data that we have. And what we see is that places that rolled this out earlier generally look pretty similar to those that rolled it out later. It's not correlated with the wealth of the area or with baseline crime records. And uh, once it gets rolled out in a given uh, station, we do see the total number of registered crimes in that station going up substantially. Uh, this is a, a stagger, another staggered event study. So we've done um, a couple of different uh, of these alternative estimators and the results really look very similar to, to what I'm showing you in the figure here. Uh, hey, finally, what I want to highlight. Hey, two more minutes. Excellent. Um, uh, finally, what I want to highlight is that uh, both, so I've talked about the effect, two effects here. One is the effect of additional political pressure, and the second is the effect of this new crime uh, report tracking database. The incidence of both of these effects are strongest for the poorer neighborhoods in the city. So here we've divided up the sample into tertiles by baseline uh, wealth in the, baseline neighborhood wealth measures, and we see that these effects really look kind of strongest for the poorest neighborhoods. This is a political alignment effect, and this is uh, the, the green bars here, which you see at the top, are the, the poorest, poorest style of neighborhoods, um, the effect of the new crime tracking database. So it seems to be something that's like, disproportionately affecting and also being uh, uh, mitigated for relatively poor areas. So just to sum up, we use administrative microdata to document police manipulation of signals to political principles. We see that police are less likely to report and process citizen crime reports in areas that support the governing party. Um, we are doing a bunch of things that really convinced us that this is not a reduction in crime, but rather an under registration of crimes under pressure to keep the stat flow. And as this new uh, tracking database is rolled out, improving the principal's ability to observe what's going on, this reduces the under registration of crime. Uh, thank you so much, and very uh, looking, much looking forward to comments and questions either now or also by email. Great, uh, thanks, Kate. I love when uh, <clears throat> papers could be an episode of the wire. So I think you know that's uh, <laughs> uh, all right. We have about twenty-five minutes for for questions. You can <clears throat> uh, raise your hand or write your uh, question in the Q and A, and then we'll uh, ask the, the participants. Um, am I still sharing my screen or have I come out of it? No, I, okay, You're still sharing your Got screen. It. Yeah, perfect. Great. <laughs> Technical <laughs> difficulty. I mean, I guess as people think about their, their question, I wanted to ask kind of a very similar question to Augustin and, uh, and Donna in a sense is how we think about kind of the long-term nature of those results and whether we think that, you know, um, once we try match it, like for Augustin, once we start, I, one thing I would want to understand is was this like new people that were hired, the people that have been in the in the service for a long time? And I mean, and so like, would they kind of start learning that if they're in team with somebody that are quite effective, they can maybe reduce their incentives and start with them, kind of the, the optimal match might have been kind of, a, might be working in the short run, but not necessarily in the long run. And I guess similar thing for Donna, like <clears throat> the, this ethics training seems to work well in the, in the short run, but kind of how do we think about whether 
once they go back to their to their traffic station and kind of interact a lot with their potentially, <clears throat> you know, with their uh, other untrained partners, that that would the effects would kind of die down in the, in the longer run. So I just kind of uh, starting to think about that. Yeah, happy to 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 answer to the the first question. So. It's a super important um, aspect of thinking about what you know the impact of implementing the optimal assignment would be. And there's like papers by Carell and others uh, in Econometrica that find like they identify the optimal assignment and they implement it in the field, and it doesn't lead to the same effect. And so we have a, a section where we discuss you know why that's the case in their context. It's mostly they have like big teams of like 32 workers and basically they don't observe all like the possible match. So they have to make parametric assumption and their parametric assumption might, might you know, not identify the, the proper effects. In our context, we really observe each of the possible combination. So we're less worried about that, but we're st we st still could be worried about um, potential, you know, uh, change in the tax compliance function when the assignment change. Uh, and if that function that I use um, is endogenous to the assignment, then, then we could run into a problem. Thankfully, what we can do in our paper that uh, the, the paper by Carol and all uh, can do is uh, leverage the timing. So tax collector keep being randomly assigned. And so we can kind of test for some of those uh, a concern. So the first concern is effort. And I, I think that's the one you have in mind, which is simply if over time the low type workers kind of learn that they keep being assigned to low type teammates, they might be, you know, demoted, like demoralized and things might uh, fall apart. So we can test for that. What we do is we look at simply, uh, we have we have a measure at end line for each collector about their motivation. And we have several measures of, of motivation that are like the standard in the literature. And we look at is that driven by um, by who they're assigned to, both in terms of like the teammate and the household they're assigned to. Uh, and the first thing we find is that it's not really the case. So uh, like who they're assigned to in the in the present matters, but who they were assigned to in the past uh, doesn't seem to matter for their current uh, performance, both households and, and collectors. Uh, however, we, you could still be like, okay, maybe after six months, like it's only because it's six months, but if it was years and years, it would you know, still be a problem. So what we do as well as a robustness check is we, we say, well, look, let's assume they're like people like the low type collectors get completely demoralized after like the second month. So pretty extreme assumption that like they, they see the first month they're open minded. The second month they realize they only teamed with like low type collectors and households. And we assume they just drop out. Uh, and we still find that like the optimal assignment would still result in more tax compliance than the status quo. So even extreme motivation doesn't seem like to lead to a catastrophic uh, outcome in this, in this context. But again, we don't find evidence that, of those demotivation in the first place. So we shouldn't think that that's likely to be the outcome, but it's something we, we do investigate because it's uh, very important. So thanks for uh, raising that. Okay, from my side, very quickly, um, our end line was 20 months after. So not by design, but because of COVID. So I think we could kind of say there's some longevity of the impact. Um, but we're definitely interested in this. And from um, perspective of policy making, we were thinking about doing um, train the trainers training, um, but you know that's still being negotiated. So I think it's difficult to say, you know, 20 months, is that long enough? And also, as you said, once they go back to the, um, the norm of being corrupt, um, we did check whether it matters, whether your um, colleagues were trained, but we didn't find any impact your colleagues win the same district. As long as you train, your behavior change, it doesn't really matter how many people within the same district will train or not. So that was quite surprising. Thanks. Um, I guess there's also <clears throat> actually two questions in the Q&A also for Augustine and, and Donna. So I don't know if anybody has another question. Otherwise, uh, do you want to, Augustine, Donna, do you want to go read the question and answer it or do you want me to read it? If you have access to the to the Q and A, I'm I'm happy to read, even though my voice is kind of slowly going. But no, I did have a look. Um, actually, maybe Michael, you can um, sort of clarify a little bit. So, ethics of reinforcing habit of lying by inducing lying with monetary compensation. So you just maybe. Oh, I think I've just been unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I, I was just curious, you know, it's a sort of a side uh, question, but uh, that, that experiment seems specifically designed to induce uh, lying. 
by compensating lying, the, the uh, you know, the guessing the number thing. And, and so it's kind of just struck me as uh, quite an ethical paradox. If you, on the one hand, think that uh, 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 sort of small messages can have, you know, uh, persistent uh, effects. And then one of the small messages is, is a salient monetary compensated reinforcement of, of unethical behavior. So I was just curious whether you, your team thought of that or that. I don't, I don't know that literature at all, so uh, maybe there's an extensive discussion of this already. Yeah, no, thank you, Michael. So, yeah, that's quite um, standard in, in economic experiments. You were incentivized with monetary, um, real monetary um, incentive. And it has been used in different contexts where you see less, um, you see more truth telling in, um, in developed countries, in student lab experiment, in public um, service kind of environment, you see a lot of lying. But the main kind of crux of this or the, the key takeaway is that there is a reduction of it, right? So you start in the baseline with a lot of cheating. Yes, so it might have induced them to, to lie more. After they've gone through the training, you see a significant reduction in the trained um, uh, group. So I think that's, that's the kind of main headline. And happy to, to answer uh, Michael's question as well. Um, so on the, the, like the first part of the question is whether you know, the optimal assignment does not take into account the fact that the government wanted to randomize in the first place to minimize corruption, and that then implementing the optimal assignment would potentially could potentially increase uh, bribe payments. That's a super interesting uh, aspect. So on, the, on whether it kind of in, invalidates the, the rationale for the random uh, assignment, then not entirely. So what we're, the, when we design the optimal assignment and when we identify it, um, what we're doing is just uh, assuming that we match high type collector together, but we still like randomly assign the high type collector to high type teammates randomly. So we keep picking a new pool of high type collector and, and kind of randomly um, uh, assigning them. Uh, and so that, that still preserves randomization. Uh, and so that, that still should, you know, potentially curb some form of, of collusion. Um, but we do still look at whether, you know, there could be effects on, on corruption in, in our context. Uh, and what we find uh, evidence of is that as there is a slight increase in bribe payments when implementing the optimal assignment. However, it's not so much due to uh, uh, better collusion it's most likely uh, driven by simply the mechanism of the increase in tax compliance. So when we put the high type collector together, we find that they exert more effort. And a byproduct of, of this higher effort is simply that some of this higher effort translates into bribes. Some people say like, look, I'd rather pay a bribe than pay the full amount and you guys keep visiting. So I'll just give you some amount. Uh, and so when we look at bribes per visit, uh, we don't find an evidence of an increase in bribes. So as long as the government is kind of okay with the current rate of bribe per visit, it should still prefer the optimal assignment uh, to the status quo assignment. Uh, and so, th so that's kind of our answer, like kind of in two parts to that, to that uh, question in the paper. Um, on the last part, which is uh, that Michael mentioned, which is that uh, potentially the, you could have an additional problem, even if you keep randomizing high types collector to high type teammates, you might have a smaller pool of people that you're randomly assigning workers to. And that could lead to collusion. Uh, that could be the case if we had less tax collectors. But even with our 34 collectors, uh, you know, there's 17 uh, high types and 17 low types, and they only are assigned to six teammates because it's a six-month campaign. Uh, and so you, you know, you still have uh, like the chances of a repeat are pretty low in in both cases, uh, even if you were randomizing within the high type. So yes, you have that that issue, but I think you'd run into an issue if the pool was was uh, smaller uh, than in our context. But, but thanks, those are like uh, super relevant questions. So thanks for asking. Thanks. Uh, Kate, do you have a question? Yeah, I had a question for Sebastian. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how geography and geographic like, transfers across areas interact with, the, what, with what you're looking at. Because unless I misunderstood, the officers are national and the treatment is at the level of the state. So, you know, are, are, are the, are, does, is this affecting people getting transferred in or out of the state? Do, do, do these, now that the politicians are maybe more motivated to deliver to constituents, do they try to get better 
people to transfer to them. I, I didn't really understand that aspect yeah, of it. I'm really sorry. It was uh, probably because of the time limitation. But yeah, I mean, I think that so this system is basically it's kind of centralized at the start. So all of these bureaucrats, they have to go through uh, centralized training conditional on entering the system. Uh, but after that, there's actually a quasi random uh, assignment mechanism to states. So it's actually not the case that they can choose, neither politicians nor bureaucrats can actually choose uh, perfectly where these people end up. So, so it is as good as random where these uh, individual bureaucrats are essentially transferred to their respective state. And then conditional on that placement, they actually stay within their state for the rest of their uh, for the rest of their professional careers. Uh, so it's a very few cases where they actually are uh, sort of cross transfers uh, conditional on being placed within a state. I think that the exceptions are if you are uh, sort of if your partner, if you get married or something like that, then you could get transferred to, to a different geographical unit. But other than that, my, um, so I think that, so basically they stay within their uh, respective state, uh, meaning that that uh, cater or the, the, the bureaucrats within the state stays the same basically for a, quite a substantial period vis-a-vis uh, -vis the politicians for which you have higher sort of rates of, of turnover. So I hope that that clarified a bit more how the system works. Uh, so it's sort of a quasi random process where, where there, there's no, they cannot fully choose uh, where, to, where they would like to end up basically. Uh, thanks, uh, Obisna. And if you have, uh, sorry, and, and for all those, if you have questions, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, sure, I had a question. I had two questions actually for Sebastian. The, the first one was, uh, I wasn't sure. So in your, in your, in your, in the, in the empirical part, I wasn't sure what the task was. Like, I think you had a button saying example of task, but I wasn't sure how fine, uh, how fine or, or big those would be. And it seems like it will matter, like how big the group is, is going to matter for how much potential for mismatch you might have, right? So that, that was something I wanted to ask if you'd done like different definition and robustness to, to the definition uh, of, of task. The other thing I was wondering is, is there a way to check the strength of the first stage? So you have this reform that should increase the quality of the politician. Um, due to the transparency, or at least that's the argument, but in the end, you can't really like show how big it is. And, and you know, kind of, how should we think about how big is the effect on the bureaucrats relative to how big the effect on the politician, the quality of the politician is, seems to be important uh, to kind of think about how effective the reform is. Yeah, and so that's I, something I was curious about. Yeah, very good questions. I think that that is also where I'm currently sort of trying to to push the paper. Uh, so I'm sort of developing this particular part exactly for that reason, because I think that one of the key sort of limitations is, of course, that the information about the quality of politicians basically comes with the reform, right? So we don't necessarily know much about these the individuals that contest political office uh, prior to them actually uh, running for office, right? Uh, so there are some limitations there on what you can say about the uh, uh, the sort of quality of, of these uh, these individuals um, but yeah so so what I can say though is that there already exists of course uh, there is a paper that uh, looks at the impact of this reform on political selection by by Ray Fisman and co-authors and basically what they find is that this um, sort of differential turnover of politician doesn't necessarily happen until uh, the second time that you that you disclose this information so the idea being that First of all, you, you sort of submit a snapshot of your, so their story is that you submit a snapshot of your wealth, uh, but then it's not until you, you run for re-election where you actually have to submit your sort of growth uh, while, you were, while you were in office. And that's where they see sort of a, a differential turnover on the, on the politicians. So, so basically we should remember then that the, the effects that I find are actually confined to, to the first period, right? Uh, so I try to argue for this in the paper that uh, this sort of gives a hint to to what extent uh, we can say whether or not this is driven by political selection or, or incentives. And actually, even though I find it hard to, to discern these two factors from each other, I do find some suggestive evidence of this, uh, that the already existing pool of uh, politicians indeed do uh, sort of change the way that they manage the bureaucracy already before the reform becomes binding. So there are some anticipation, anticipation effects that sort of spill over 
uh, across states. So that's basically the uh, what I'm trying to, to work on in the paper currently. Uh, but I completely agree with you that I think also that that's a very important um, uh, thing to think about in this in this context. And then just very briefly on your on your first part about the definition of, of tasks. Yes, of course, this is still sort of it's administrative data. Uh, but I would say that these tasks are still they're not super fine grained. I mean, it's not like we have uh, sort of Scandinavian uh, registry data, uh, but they are still um, so I think that I have maybe around 200 distinct uh, tasks that I can observe over this time period. So that should give you sort of a sense of how detailed they are. So I would say that the categories are somewhat broad, uh, but that's basically the, uh, the, the data at hand. Uh, so I've tried doing, um, there are two categories of tasks. One is sort of the, the broader category and one is uh, a bit tighter. And actually I don't really find that there's much of a difference depending on how you define these. Uh, these categories in the in the in the paper. Thanks a lot for for your comments, questions. Um, any more questions? Otherwise, I'm kind of wanted to ask a couple of questions to Kate. Um, so the the first one is so I really like. I mean, it's really cool how you're able to kind of show that like there's actual manipulation in how the the crime is reported. I think. Mean, ah, can you still hear me? Yes. Everything. Yeah. Um, the. Uh, <laughs> That the, the crime is reported. One thing I was so you showed that it's like the effect are stronger in places where there's like that are poor in a sense. And I was wondering whether you can also look at like, I don't know, other groups that are expected to be marginalized. So I was wondering whether kind of crimes against women are also like more likely to be underreported. And like that could kind of go into your the same direction. And the other thing is when you look at the kind of aligned versus non-aligned, I'm wondering whether uh, I mean, is there something more about the fact that like what they might care more about is places where they're kind of they're starting to lose votes, so it's a bit more marginal. And I was wondering whether you might want to kind of look at different classifications okay. of, of districts and see whether there's a way to look at places that are that they used to control and they've lost control and they might want to kind of keep an, an, an eye on them a bit more. And the, the final thing would be, I don't know if you it might be really tricky to get the data, but if they do, if there's some sort of like kind of transfer and promotion on the fairly fixed schedule. You might want to be especially worried about how the politician sees you at around the time where you're about to be promoted or transferred. And so if you see that the effects are stronger in places where the kind of the head of the police station or the number of the policemen are around that time might be might be useful. Yeah. Thanks for all of those. So um, just on the first one, unfortunately we don't observe very much about this is this data uh, we we don't observe very much about the characteristics of the people. Um, we do see the category of crime in terms of gender-based violence, but unfortunately the reporting of that overall is very low, and so I'm not sure if we have enough in the data to really be able to differentiate that, uh, but it's something we could think about. Um, but as far as people's, you know, other characteristics we don't observe, um, I think definitely uh, it's a good point about marginal constituencies and other ways of defining that right-hand side right hand side variable we were we, we that is something we we are we've kind of been talking about robustness to different ways of uh of of uh defining that and i, I guess it's you know you could think maybe that's also more of a mechanism test in some sense to understand kind of what the what they're trying to ma what the politicians are trying to maximize um so the transfers and promotions uh, is actually something I didn't talk about it today for reasons of time and also because we're still kind of working on uh, redoing this a little bit, but we actually see some really interesting things going on with this in that the transfers, we don't, we don't, I don't think that there is a fixed, there's not a fixed schedule of how often people get transferred, but the transfers are very much politicized, politicized and we do see that the effects are actually driven by people who are transferred at a particular point in the electoral cycle. Um, and so when we look at, we're trying to basically work now on classifying people who are officers who are transferred at different stages because there's a, you know, the pre-election, a caretaker government, which is supposed to be neutral and then after the election. And so we, we do actually see pretty big patterns of heterogeneity right there that we're trying to sort of tie together. So, um, yeah, I, th I, I don't, I, 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 but it's a good idea. We should double check if there's any kind of like maximum time that they're supposed to uh serve before they get transferred i think mostly it's discretionary thanks a lot thanks um okay we have four more minutes for a few extra questions if you have any 
uh, Sebastian, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Kate uh, whether or not there was any sort of heterogeneity along the uh, electoral competition. So, so uh, you were talking about political alignment. Would do you also see anything in terms of how competitive each election was, um, and along that dimension, basically? Yeah, that's something that we. I think that uh, uh, it's it's something that we should explore. We haven't looked at it. We don't have um, a huge number of different constituencies. But uh, but it's something we can definitely check. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right. Um, okay. Any any final thoughts? No. Okay. So otherwise, uh, thanks to the presenter for some really exciting papers. I mean, uh, I think if we had been talking like 15 years ago about randomizing things about the police or tax official everybody would have been would mind would have been blown so let's you know let's keep in mind that this is still very mind-blowing so thanks a lot for that and i look forward to seeing where those papers end up and i also would like to remind you that the conference is ongoing for another couple of days it's the last political economy session but there's a lot of other relevant sessions you might you're strongly encouraged to attend so thanks to the presenter and thanks a lot to uh, nan for managing the whole thing in the background and making sure the whole technology works so thanks and uh, see you soon thanks everybody Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.